I'm sorry. Can I get a clap? No. <laughs> I got to be more creative with the rhymes. Who Who's here today? Suleiman's here from Libya. Please tell us where you're from. Nevis, I know, is in Italia. All, all. I like that name, all, all. All, all is from everywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Rod is here from Egypt. Vanessa's here from Brazil. Fluency family in the house. Who do we have from Oman Noura? Pakistan represented by Madia. Tunisia. Oh, I couldn't even catch the name. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Now it's just going, flowing, cracking, popping, popping. Costa Rica. I haven't seen a I've seen Marcella here. That's right. Costa Rica is here. Tatiana from Russia. Pablo Hernandez in Paris. Woo! We got a lot of folks here. As we have been fortunate to always have in this MOOC. Really amazing energy, wonderful vibe, sharing, caring, exchanging information, teaching each other, not just people, teachers with more experience, less experience, that too, but even more importantly, what I'm seeing, what we're all seeing is people with different kinds of experience, not just how many years you've been teaching. So we've had some people who've been teaching a long time, but they haven't they haven't been exposed to certain things. Other people just getting into teaching who know a lot more maybe about, for example, technology, tools. It's really just an amazing, amazing thing. And you can see I have someone else with me today. This is Mr. Justin Murray. And you've already met him, uh, most of you. Well, how many of you have met Justin? Let's see, how many of you did the pre-class task? And don't worry if you didn't. This is not a test to, to see if you, know, if you didn't have time. You can go afterwards and do it. Uh, Barbara did it. Good. I saw Justin in there a few minutes ago. I will tell you when the next MOOC is going to be. Good question. Uh, this, is, this is Justin's uh, first time in our MOOC. I wanted him to do it last time. I couldn't fit him in. Here he is now. He, uh, he's going to tell you more about himself because he can do a better job of that than I can. Although I do know a lot about this guy, working very closely with him, uh, especially recently. And his wonderful collective of teachers and video makers and bloggers, especially bloggers, Real Life English. So if you haven't heard of Real Life English, you absolutely will. Uh, not just today, but you'll start to see them. Uh, they pop up everywhere. Amazing, amazing stuff they're doing. And uh, Justin... I'll turn things over to you, man. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'll just disappear. You want me back? You just summon me, and I'm there. <laughs> Justin Murray, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Chase. Hey, guys. Really happy to be here today. Um, so, I thank you for the wonderful introduction, Jason. Chase, it was, and was like you, the team as well. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'm seeing that people are from a lot of places, and there's some real-life English people in there, too, so thank you to everybody who came out, support. Um, it's really, really great to be here. So, hello, world. I'm representing real-life English, and my lecture today is going to be on unconventional approaches to accent reduction, music, mimicry, and sound morphing. So, just being in the pre-course page, I was looking at people's responses, and I was really blown away by how much people are participating in this, how much people are learning. I was really just blown away. Like, um, people are learning so much. People are really dedicated to this. And I can see that people's perception is changing. So that made me really excited to be here. And that's Real Life English. That's our logo. So this is a picture of the world. Um, I wanted to start this by asking where you guys are from. But Jace already did that, and we saw a lot of places all over the world. And as you can see, this is a world that's totally interconnected. It's You have people from everywhere. I, I saw this yesterday um, and on, on the Internet, on Facebook, and it really blew me away as well. So in the United States, growing up, when we went to school, we used to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And so this is sort of like this loyalty to your country. And I don't know, like nowadays, I think that we, we're beyond that. We're all world citizens in some way. And so 
English connects the world, and I think this is a really it's a viable, um, alive example of this. And it's really exciting to see everybody here. This chat, this feed, really inspiring. And just talking about this concept of world citizenship, um, because English is what connects us. It's what gives us the ability to communicate, to really spread information, um, expand your perspective, and you can see the world and your country with new eyes. And so I think, like, I, I see myself as an American really, really differently. So I just wanted to take a moment just to be aware that we're connecting as world citizens, even though we're all from different places in the world. It's really awesome to be here and share this moment. So this is Beyond Borders. So thank you for helping me realize that. So here's an overview of the presentation I'm about to give. Introduction. I'm going to talk about a little bit about me and real life English, about pronunciation, the awareness, because this has been something that we talked about a lot in this course, um, in this MOOC, just awareness, awareness, awareness. It's impossible to learn everything now, but if you're aware how important this is, of the resources, and just that it's there, it exists, um, gradually learn. So I'm going to give you a few techniques that, that have worked for me. Um, we're going to talk about sound morphing. I'm going to piggyback the ideas of, of Jace and LNCMC and some other people as well. Content versus function words. Uh, we're going to talk about something called the mimic method. Reverse accent mimicry. And then a few listening strategies. So, and then we're going to bring it together. So, we're going to start with Two knock-knock jokes, because it's always good to start with humor, and I think these are relevant to what we're talking about today. How many of you guys have heard of knock-knock jokes? Say yes if you've heard of them. Anybody? Knock-knock jokes? Okay. Let's see what they are. This is knock-knock. Who's there? Honeydew? Honeydew who? Honey, do you love me? <laughs> so this is something that... I. Ah, Carissa, you're going to present this tomorrow. That's awesome. So it's funny. It's 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 different type of humor. They are. This is a warning here because knock knock jokes are cheesy. They're cheesy humor. <laughs> uh, cheesy and corny humor. Poor quality, but they're funny. And that's exactly what makes it really great for learners. And I think it's a great way to really subtly present pronunciation. So let's start. Um, so what do you guys see there? Are these guys police officers? All ages, all levels, too. Police. So the routine of this knock-knock joke is I say knock-knock as if we're knocking on the door. And then you say, who's that? And I say, police. Police who? Police let me in. It's cold out here. The joke is that police sounds a lot like police. Please let me in. It's cold out here. So if you thought it was funny, you can laugh. If you thought it was cheesy if you don't need to. <laughs> but there's another one. Who do we have here? Who is this? Anybody know? <laughs> Harry Potter. Harry. Knock, knock. You guys can repeat wherever you're at. Who's there? Harry. Harry who? Harry up. It's cold out here. <laughs> hurry up. Can you see the difference? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Knock, knock. Corny, yes. Cheesy, yes, but fun. <laughs> Nana. Nana who? Nana your business. None of your business. What, is it, what are they doing there? Anybody know? This is actually a verb. He is... The man is scolding his son. Scold. This is a name here. Knock, knock. Who's there? Scold. Scold who? Scold enough squad skating out here. It's cold enough squad ice skating out here. As you can see, the scold and cold, this, what, this is what makes it funny because they're so similar. Just a couple more. Knock, knock. Who's there? 
Orange. Orange who? Aren't you going to let me in? It's cold out here. <laughs> aren't you going to let me in? It's cold out here. As you can see, orange, aren't you? The final one, no, there's one more after this, actually. Who's this? Anybody know the actor's name, the actress, the woman? This is Claire Danes. Claire, Claire Danes. Who's there? Claire. Claire who? Claire the way I'm coming through. Clear the way I'm coming through. Okay? The final one. Knock knock. Who's there? Jenny? Jenny who? Jenny, need any help opening the door? Did you need any help opening the door? This is actually how we pronounce it. Jenny. Jenny. It's kind of funny, buddy. Okay. Did you guys find that funny? Good? They're very cheesy, but cheesiness is acceptable, I think, with learners of all ages. It's a good way to, to really uh, relax the atmosphere and have fun with the class. If you recognize they're cheesy at the beginning, I think you're not going to be um, held accountable. So, there's a little bit about me. I'm from the United States. I'm from near Seattle. I'm not from Seattle, but I'm from near there. This is where I'm from on the map. This is a picture of Seattle. Yes, it does help learners relax. I was born in Washington State. I'm 34 years old. I moved to Colorado and went to university there. I studied humanities with emphasis on philosophy and English literature. And I have lived eight of the past ten years outside of the United States in Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, and now Brazil. So my teaching background, this is where I live. This is in Belo Horizonte in Brazil. I volunteered in the U.S. a few hours a week in 2004, just teaching like um, undocumented immigrants in the United States. I taught for a few months in Mexico in 2005. I taught English literature at a bilingual high school, American high school in Colombia in Manizales. Then I moved to Belo Horizonte in Brazil in 2010, where I currently live. And then co-founded Real Life English in 2011. And so the last thing, my best teaching insights come from my language learning. This is something that pushes my teaching forward. Um, the more I learn languages, the more I kind of like work through my struggles, the more that I feel comfortable teaching and passing those insights to my students. Hello. What's your native language? I want to see your native language on that because we have many, many languages here. Arabic, Arabic, Russian, English, Urdu, sorry for my pronunciation, Afrikaans, wow, Spanish, Arabic, English, Vietnamese, Spanish, man, there's a lot of languages. Mexican, that's Spanish. Arabic, Chinese, Russian, man, what diversity here, this is beautiful. Romanian, American English, British, Indonesian, wow. How many languages do you speak? I know we have some polyglots out here. Three, six, four, three, three, two, five. We have six at the most. Anybody have more? Six, four, wow. Polyglots in here. You guys are great language learners. Okay. Nice job. What languages are you learning? Final question here. What languages are you guys learning? Italian, Korean. I speak some Spanish. I speak. I spoke better before, but I forgot it. I learned Portuguese. And I speak Portuguese. Um, wow. You guys are learning some languages. It's awesome. This is great. It's important to keep your language learning alive as your teacher. As we know. It's better to have that, our students insight. So this is about real life English now. Real life English. We do, we started with English speaking parties in 2011. And then we started, we, we started getting people together because we were teaching and we just wanted to bring people together to use their English. And this is a picture 
of some of our community members, one of our events, and then we started, after a while doing this, we deepened into our teaching and we realized that we wanted to start a blog. And now, when you start a blog, you started a community and everything's just grown and now we want to make this as international as possible. We have events in Brazil, we have events in Spain, um, we have communities growing in other countries as well right now, like uh, Argentina, Indonesia. So if you guys are in any of those countries, if you want to if you want to join up, just find us on Facebook. But we, our goal is to have a, an English-speaking party in every single city in the world, every single major city in the world. So we have it in four locations right now. So our mission is to inspire, connect, and empower people all around the world to learn English, the fun, natural, and real life way. So when we say real life way, we sort of have a philosophy behind that, which is to inspire and motivate teachers and learners. This is more of self-development because if you are motivated, if you are inspired, you are going to do what it takes to learn because it, you can't be lazy and learn. We know that. As teachers, it's our job to inspire students. It's, it's our job to pass them the vision of English, for them, to help them see it with new eyes. Um, we also try to help people use your life to improve your English and your English to improve your life. And ultimately, this makes the world better So because... If you, there's so much English literature out there, English media, pop culture, that there's, it's a shame if you don't use this to improve your English. The more that you do this, the more that your life becomes more and more harmonious with English. And our goal is to make English a fun, natural, convenient part of your life. Sorry for the typo. But practice some of the things you like. So I'm going to give you two unconventional ideas for this presentation to start out. Hold on, there's a transcend and include. Learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. This is a, it's a quote that inspires me. It's, I think it's true for anything, really, if you think about it. It's like there are the rules, there's convention, but it's not everything. Sometimes convention and rules prevent us from being our best. But we must recognize and respect why the rules are there in the first place, but not be limited by them. So, grammar, it's important to recognize that it has a place, it's great, but you can't be, let it limit you because sometimes it doesn't explain everything. Remember that the language is here, was here first, not grammar. It's like we're speaking, the, lang the language is here first, and grammar is trying to map the way we speak, not the other way around. They can't constrict the evolution of the language. So this applies to language learning. Use grammar to help you, but don't be a grammar Nazi. Remember, we're, to learn, we need to make mistakes. We need to have fun. We need to just feel free to fall on our faces and get back up. So the 80-20 rule, this is called the Pareto Principle. For many events, 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. 80% of the land is owned by 20% of the population. This is a reoccurring theme in the world and in many, many disciplines. 80% of the sales come from 20% of the clients. 20% of your relationships produce 80% of your value in your life. 80% of the successful learners come from 20% of the teachers. Is that true? 20% of the activities produce 80% of the results. Does this apply to pronunciation and accent reduction training? I think maybe it could. This is what I'm going to argue today. I'm going to show you some evidence that maybe it might apply. The fluency gap. I took this word from Drew Badger, just so you guys know. Uh, I was watching his presentation and I thought it was a really great way to explain um, exactly what it is. The, 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 that gap, the discrepancy between the way that people expect us to speak and the way that we really speak. So. Native speakers speak differently than most people learn in school. Seemingly faster, we put our words together. It's incomprehensible, confusing for most learners. We speak in chunks. We cut and shorten certain words. We morph our sounds. We shrink and link. Few people are learning the musicality of the English language, the rhythm, the stress, the intonation that guides the way natives speak. And few teachers are giving the students a framework to deal with this and respond. 
So I'm sure you guys have been learning about this because I saw on the class page that everybody, everybody has been watching the classes and then learning a lot. So my objectives when I teach this are to build awareness, number one. Learners should be aware of the fluency gap from early on in their learning process. Develop the tools to respond when they don't understand by teaching the fluent use of survival phrases. This lowers the effective filter and gives them the proper attitude to learn, to relax. The effective filter is that fear you get, that fear. You're scared. You can't really express yourself because you're scared. But if you can lower back, if people are relaxed, they learn much better. We all know that. And to simultaneously teach the grammatical structure and comprehension of these sound chunks in a systemized and intuitive way. And fluent comprehension and use of these in appropriate and meaningful contexts. Contexts to integrate them into class. I'm going to show you the activity here. What is our role as a teacher first? I think this is changing. It's no longer the teacher in front of the classroom giving a lecture, having the students take notes. To inspire, to motivate. It's more like we're a coach in some ways. We're facilitators. The classroom is flipped. There's so many great resources nowadays. There's no reason not to do this. Blended learning. You need to give them the resources. Inspire them to go watch it. Make them have fun. Entertain them. Monitor, yes. Facilitators to challenge them. And we're psychologists in, in some sense. When you, when you help them reduce fear, remove and lower the, the effective filter, you are a psychologist. You help them deal with that because they're taught in school that it's not okay to make mistakes. But we know as language learners, we have to make mistakes. We have to, to fall down many times and get back up. We're mentors to give them guidance. We're also trainers to help them develop the technical skills. Some great answers in here, guys. Keep it up. To help them to every side they need. And so, one of the goals here, the first goal is to develop, develop awareness from early on in the process. So, I put a quote here. The mind does not easily unlearn what it has been long in learning. And I mean this with pronunciation. You let them know early on that you don't read it, or you speak it. It's much easier to teach it and help them develop. For both listening comprehension and pronunciation training. So building awareness. How much does pronunciation affect fluency? A lot? A little? What do you guys think? A lot? How interconnected are listening comprehension and pronunciation? Do you need to have a huge grammar base before you start teaching or learning pronunciation? These are interesting questions. I'm not sure if the answer is extremely clear. It can go both ways, I think. At what point in the process should you start to teach and learn pronunciation? How interdependent are accent pronunciation and comprehensibility? Hold on. The slide is jammed up. Do we need great pronunciation to be fluent? It's yes and no. Let's look at both sides. I think there are good arguments on both sides. Argument one, no pronunciation is not that important. Communication is the key to fluency. People say that it doesn't matter if your pronunciation isn't great, but you need to communicate. I, I agree with that to some, to some extent. We all have accents. It doesn't matter if you're from Colombia, you're going to have a Colombian accent when you speak English. I'm from the United States. I have a, an American accent when I speak Portuguese or Spanish. So we all have accents. Your accent is a representation of where you are from. And foreign accents can be cute, right? Is that true? Are they cute? <laughs> Any other reasons? Okay, argument two. Yes, pronunciation is very important. It makes communication easier. It increases comprehensibility. 
It improves confidence. It improves social integration. If you can speak like the people, if you can, you can connect with them in different ways. And you're less a foreigner in that sense. More arguments for improved pronunciation. With effective practice, improvements can be quick and dramatic. Again, the 80-20 principle. This is a very powerful way to improve your fluency if you do it right. A lot of learners believe it's important. They, they believe it's important, so it's naturally going to lead to more success, because it's just because they believe it. Do we need great pronunciation to be fluent? We need our accent to, be, to at least be comprehensible, right? If people don't understand you, even if you have the best grammar in the world, sorry, you're not fluent. It's people can't understand you. The point of, of language learning is to communicate. The better your pronunciation, the more likely you will be comprehended. And this will be more nuanced, too. It will be greater depth. It won't just be like a simple understanding of the situation, but you can communicate with much more sophisticated uh, depth. People will have to make less of an effort to understand you. They feel more comfortable talking with you. People will perceive you as more fluent and feel more comfortable talking with you. So, do we need to be? Do we need great pronunciation to be fluent? Not exactly, but it can be a great help. So, some different aspects of accent. We have accentedness, which is the degree to which pronunciation of the utterance sounds different from an unexpected production pattern. That should be from an expected, sorry I made a typo there, from an expected production pattern. Comprehensibility is the listener's ability to understand the meaning of an utterance in its context. And they found out that there's a quasi-independent relationship between comprehensibility and accentedness. So I want to share with you guys a study that I wrote about in the article for the pre-class. 12 hours of accent training over a six-week period of two hours per week. The learners were of mixed levels. There was a 47.7% increase in comprehensibility among learners. And the judges were native-speaking judges. This is one study with dramatic results, but there are more. This suggests that the 80-20 rule 80% of the effects comes with 20% of the effort. So why are more people teaching this? First of all, I would say that a lot of people don't have awareness of the root causes of this fluency gap. Most teachers don't have much training in their own learning and teaching. And there haven't been a lot of resources up until now. So. Because there is a tendency to spoon feed our students' grammar rules rather than showing them how to respond and use their English in authentic, meaningful contexts. Do you guys know what spoon feed means? How many people know what spoon feed means? It's like you, you have a spoon, you give them the food. Spoon feeding our students. <laughs> By not speaking enough English in class. By not giving them the tools to respond when they don't know by not showing them how English is really spoken. So the knock-knock jokes, to relax, to have fun, to recognize the sounds behind the words. That's the first technique. Knock-knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange you can on the end. So the huge importance of confidence. Going back to that knock-knock joke, the effective filter, for us to fake it until we make it. Because as we know, our students come in and the first obstacle they have is, is their fear. Their fear is the biggest barrier to learning. Effective filter. Students have this idea that they need to be perfect. And mistakes, they need to learn that mistakes are a natural part of the process. So it's our job to teach them confidence too. Hold on. Survival phrases. So this is one of the things I teach to beginners especially, but advanced students as well, because sometimes they don't respond the right way when they don't know. And so 
The objective is to lower the effective filter to give students the tool and tools and confidence to respond to any situation. I also call these this cultural fluency. So when they don't understand to be to, to learn to say sorry, excuse me, not as, as something they think about, but something they need to learn, they need to memorize, they need to ingrain into their English and become fluent in. Even if they don't speak that much English, if they can speak, they can say sorry. This changes the psychological dimension of the communication. Can you repeat slower, please? And then what does that mean? They can ask. They don't feel, they don't feel futile, futile, futile in their communication. How do you say? They can describe it. What do you mean? What do you mean by it? And so with this, they develop pieces and chunks of fluency through repetition and integration into everyday use. So this is something they come in, they don't know any of this, but you teach them how to respond to these questions when they don't know, and then that, that effective filter lowers immediately when they learn this, because they might not be fluent in English, but they can respond in this way. So this is the structure. It's almost like it's armor for them. It makes them feel safe in an English-speaking environment. Learn the phrases through memorization, repetition. Put the words together until they come out. And then you work on imitation, native pronunciation, until they're fluent with these phrases. Sorry? Can you repeat, please? So this is an example of, of shrinking and linking here. What does, they start out by saying, what does that mean? And they struggle to create, to reproduce it. But after they're reproducing it, you can teach them what is. What does that mean? What does that mean? How do you say? At the beginning, they're going to say, how do you? They're trying to remember, remember it. They're trying to memorize it. But once they learn it, it's automatic. Then you can go into the Im imitation, the mimicry. How do you say? How do you say? What do you mean? What do you mean? This is, this is not like... This gives the, the, the learner the ability to ask the person to rephrase what they're saying. It means that they understand the person, but they don't comprehend the person. What do you mean? What do you mean? And then, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? So in Brazil, for example, people say, do you understand a lot? Do you understand is correct grammar, but it's not really... It's, it's, it's not really cultural fluency because it's, I'm not asking, do you understand me? I'm asking if you understand where I'm coming from, my perspective, if you're, if you're following me, not do you understand. If you say, do you understand to everybody, you're showing a lack of confidence. So fluent survival phrases protect the learner and give them the tools to respond when they don't understand. So I can't emphasize that enough. This really, really helps when they learn them. There's going to be a psychological transformation that will happen. And they'll be much more confident. So the immediate effect of fluent use of survival phrases is increased confidence in native speaking situations. So it's a huge psychological step in cultural fluency. So what I mean by cultural fluency is that native speakers will feel more comfortable talking with them because it will show a proactive attitude towards the language. Like leaning forward, I notice there's a cultural difference here in Brazil, for example. When, when students don't understand something, it's like, I didn't understand. There's this withdrawal from the situation. Whereas if you, if you show proactivity, you're going to approach the situation, and the person you're talking with is going to help you a lot more. So with these as well, when they learn the native pronunciation, the the pronunciation paradigm is broken, the old one. So it's like the, 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 they're more open to learning sounds the way they're spoken rather than the way that they, the book says or the way that, that it's written. Students are more comfortable with the use of English in the classroom. And they will naturally start to listen and imitate. And they say, what does, what does that mean? They are fishing for the words. They're trying to understand the words. So. When you hear a word, for example, um, windowsill, like you hear windowsill, most people don't know what that is. 
but you hear it. So what does windowsill mean? When you say what does windowsill, you're imitating the word. You're forced to imitate on a regular basis. And these phrases promote a curiosity for the language that enables them to investigate and experiment. So the, the technique number three is doing pretty much the same thing with greetings and goodbyes. So greetings and goodbyes, it's like you start every conversation, every meeting with a greeting. People come in, you say, and you greet people every single time, so you're always going to use it. You're going to repeat the use of this. So how are you doing? It's not how are you doing. It's just morphing, shrinking, and linking. How are you doing? And so at the beginning of classes, you can bring them together, you can teach them, how are you doing? How have you been? It's not how have you been, it's how have you been? How have you been? It was good to see you. It was good to see you. It was good to see you. So the idea is to take these basic building blocks of the language that they're going to repeat, reuse, to make them routines. And you, you, you teach them not only how to say it, first of all, but how to imitate. And then it becomes these little examples of fluency, these little chunks of fluency that they can use on a regular basis. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So we use these all the time to start and end every con conversation with confidence. So the repetition, the functionality, and small bits of fluency are really, really important. And it gives students something to work with, with pronunciation from day one. So to start and end every conversation with, fluent, with confidence is really, really important. Okay, the fourth technique is called two of the tenses, fluency exercise. So what you see here is you see all the tenses here. You see the simple present. You see the, the simple future simple. You see the, the present continuous, future continuous, past continuous. So with all of these, there are standard uh, constructions, conjugations that turn into shrinking and linking. So right here you have a girl riding her bike. So she has training wheels. This is pretty much, the metaphor here is that this is training wheels for your fluency. So this is a framework to learn the conjugation of tenses through repeated use in meaningful contexts. So it's like native-like pronunciation training. So for example, the future simple, going to, gonna. At the end of class, talking about the weekend, you give it lots of structure with its first application. What are you going to do this weekend? You start with teaching them the, the grammar structure, but once they, they get that down, what are you going to do this weekend? What are, what are you going to do this weekend? And the answer is, I'm going to, I'm going to watch the soccer game. I'm going to watch the soccer game. So they start out with basic, basic grammar, learning the, the conjugation, you give them a homework assignment, but then you actually repeat it. You repeat it every class. And then the idea is it actually becomes a relaxed part of the class. And if you keep doing this, it will be. And it will become a normal conversation. Subjectives so of this exercise. Repeated use in meaningful context to teach. So again, meaningful. They really want to talk about what they're going to do on the weekend. They really want to talk about what they're going to do that day. So, competence with grammar to lower and remove the effective filter. And then to teach fluency in chunks, and to develop scripts, because we all know this when we learn a foreign language, we, we pretty much have the same conversations over and over again, and we repeat them, and we repeat them, and we get more and more fluent as we go along. So, Really, we are developing scripts. Maybe we're not fluent in every situation. Maybe we're not fluent in the whole language, but we can be fluent in certain situations through repetition, through meaningful context and practice. And this is a really great way to start with a typo, um, to imitate native pronunciation. The second example, did. So at the beginning of class, 
first class of the week, I always say, what did you do on the weekend? We have this, this routine, this procedure. So it starts with you teach the simple past. But then once they actually learn the structure of it, then you, you teach them to imitate, you teach them to, to shrink and link. What did you do on the weekend? What did you do on the weekend? And then you practice the past tense verbs. You practice the, the correct grammar as well. I watched a movie. I did my homework. I hung out with my friends. And this gets more and more sophisticated as you teach it more. But then it, it turns into just a natural part of the class. So with a continued application, as you can see, this girl here, she took her training wheels off. So the, the exercise is to create the structure to teach shrinking and linking, to teach correct grammatical structure in, in safe situations. And, and little by little with practice, it becomes a natural routine in the class. So to introduce, practice, and learn both written and spoken English and formal writing. We don't teach the, the gonna, for example, in, in writing at the beginning especially, because they need to learn how to write correctly. So to use it to teach listening comprehension, mimicry and imitation, and to reinforce survival phrases. Because as they go along, they, they will be using the survival phrases. And they will be forced to face that psychological barrier that, that they have with the language, with the way it's really spoken. So again, to gradually remove the training wheels until it becomes a quick, natural, and fluent conversation. And then the final example of this is a present perfect continuous. So I have been, so this is like the beginning of class in the middle of the week. What have you been doing lately? 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 And they have a chance to practice the present perfect continuous. So I've been, I've been hanging out with my friends. I've been studying. I've been having fun. I've been watching TV. I've, I've been playing video games. And it's a really simple structure, but it gives them something to work with. So the tour of the tense objectives integrate each tense into a meaningful and repeatable classroom routine that serves as continual practice to gradually teach each student to relax and comprehend at normal speed and rhythm in sound chunks and to systematically teach appropriate formal and informal use of verb tenses through writing, speaking, and pronunciation practice. So why natives speak differently than you learned? Sound morphing. The hidden rhythm of English, of the English language, shrinking and linking, discourse markers, sound morphing, how native speakers cut, shorten, bring together, and leave out words and sound chunks, leave, and leave out words and sounds in the English language. Most common examples, gonna, wada, gonna, gotta, and wanna. I want to, I wanna. You've got to, you got to. I'm sorry, the last one should be gonna. I'm going to, I'm gonna. So these are just three of the most tangible examples. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, in this sense. And because there's much more beneath the surface. So the star indicates that this is for informal writing. More classic examples. Kind of, kind of, sort of, sort of, but we don't write sort of, ever. Let me, let me, give me, give me, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, a lot of, a lot of. This is just the way we speak in formal and informal situations. Native speakers use sound morphing in spoken English in both formal and informal contexts in spoken English. Native speakers are usually not conscious of this in the 
the formality and register is expressed in the intonation of the speech and not so much in the way that we, we shrink and link. I learned that from, from Fluency MC, actually, from Jace. And we should certainly focus on learning to write properly, but not use the, the morphs when we're writing, especially uh, in formal writing. So should you use these? You should at least understand them, teach students to understand them, and teach the formal writing of these. Play around with them before you use them. And then music is really, really a great way to integrate these, to implement them. Shrinking and linking. This is from Jason Levine, influenced by him. Let me call her tomorrow morning. Let me call her tomorrow morning. Let me call her tomorrow morning. Repeat. Repeat after me. Let me call her tomorrow morning. If you see her, if you see him before he gets home, would you ask him? If you see him, if you see him before he gets home, would you ask him? Repeat. If you see him, if you see him before he gets home, before he gets home, would you ask him? Would you ask him? There are a lot of people who are not even come, going to come. There are a lot of people who are not even going to come. There, there are a lot of people who are not even going to come. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are not, not even going to come. So intonation and stress. This is another really, really important element in pronunciation. So let's give some examples here of different situations. I didn't say you stole the money. I didn't say you stole the money. I didn't say he 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 stole the money. So each one of these is, has a different, slightly different uh, meaning depending on the intonation. So intonation is really, really important together with the shrinking and linking and the sound working. So this is more like the background music of it, which carries the, the way that, that we shrink and link the words. So content versus function words. This is another piece of the puzzle, which really helped me understand this. This is um, from Rachel's English. And Jace, could you please show the video of this? So this is pretty much Rachel talking about Content, words. Hold on. Yo. Let me tell you about a situation We live in a world divided by races and nations And nobody learns the other person's language knows So I'm like, yo, somebody needs to change it So I started thinking about this thing called flow Si me permites hablar en español Yo te explico con las lenguas lo que es más importante que es el ritmo Es como procesamos la palabra conectada Y si no aprendes esto tú no vas a aprender nada Con sus tablas de conjugaciones Mira, tírense los textos y canten más canciones 
La idea é muito sencilla, se for era pegar, se puedes hablar, sim eu posso falar O português também, sempre me perguntam como é que se pode falar sem sotaque Cara, eu aprendi português através do rap E ajuda também que eu sou um craque Da música fonética, linguística, eu fiz uma técnica um pouco científica Pra ensinar como pegar esse flow Tô chifado, ni doi ba li de ji go Ba ko yu no li bian de yue lai yue Xiang ho lai zhong wo ren shuo de hua Ni zhu hui mo fa In English we call it mimic And no it's not a gimmick I take it target language and teach you to rap in it Oh And you don't even got a no jack in it Lay back Take the sound, break it down with me, phonetic You learn the syllables separate and then connect them together What you get is pénible Oh ouais, my boy, put this on my perry Du push que l'on t'a comme un go fast on belly Mon tonni, mon dore nice, a ve kari no mare Ma chi tu as puto maru bombore Si mo chumo so mafiosi, heck what you say Be ki no di get the salio, re pou prodi Pou te hebo a hot on rose Ya mundo li Fonki no ache we ganga ferki mata pelos Fa fili ka fi yo katun gi ma fole ka mo wa no kole I don't claim to be the first person to claim it But if language is sound and sound is music Well that sounds like music is language Que? Não entendi Como porra nenhuma que ele riste? Listen I don't want anyone here to confuse it But if music is sound and sound is language That means that language is music Buenísimo the case. English is a stress-timed language. That means some syllables when we're writing, right? especially uh, in formal writing. So should you use these? You should at least understand them, teach students to understand them, and teach the formal writing of these. Play around with them before you use them, and then music is really, really a great way to integrate these, to implement them. Shrinking and linking. This is from their own. In this American English pronunciation video, we're going to go over why some. In this American English pronunciation video, sound different when they're said. Some words sound on their own when they're said then on they their own. One sec. How many videos are you hearing? <laughs> I'm hearing one video. Okay. Right now, are you hearing nothing? Um, I'm hearing nothing right now, yeah. Nothing right now. Okay, <laughs> try that again. Do when they're said as part of a sentence. Like, for. For. There's a problem. One second, let me try to figure it out. A lot of people think when they're studying a language and they're new to it that they need to pronounce each word fully and clearly in order to be well understood. But in English, that's actually not the case. English is a stress-timed language. That means some syllables will be longer and some will be shorter. Many languages, however, are syllable-timed, which means each syllable has the same length. Examples of syllable-timed languages, French, Spanish, Cantonese. 
So when an American hears a sentence of English with each syllable having the same length, it takes just a little bit longer to get the meaning. This is because we are used to stress syllables. Syllables that will pop out of the line because they're longer and they have more shape. Our ears, our brains go straight to those words. Those are the content words. When all syllables are the same length, then there's no way for the ear to know which words are the most important. So this is why stress is so important in American English. It's a stress-timed language. When you give us nice shape in your stressed syllables, you're giving us the meaning of the sentence. This means that other syllables need to be unstressed, flatter, quicker, so that the stressed syllables are what the ear goes to. This is why it's so important to reduce function words that can reduce in American English. When those function words are part of a whole, part of a sentence, they are pronounced differently. Let's look at some examples. Dida. Dida. Do you know what I'm saying? A native speaker might not either, but in the context of a sentence, I'm going to the store. A native speaker would know exactly what I was saying. I'm going to the store. I'm going to the store. When to the is pronounced to the, to the, reduced and linked, going and store become the obvious words in that sentence. I'm going to the store. What about kaza? Kaza. Can you understand what I'm saying? A native speaker might not either, but in the sentence fragment, cause of my job, cause of my job, a native speaker would know exactly what I was saying, because of my job, cause of my job. Because and of are so unstressed, so reduced and low in pitch that the word job is able to really jump out of the sentence because of my job. This is really of primary importance in American English pronunciation. As you're working on pronunciation, keep in mind this idea of a word being part of a whole. The word for. Part of a whole becomes for. For. For you. For me. For dinner. Practice it this way. Drill it over and over. Other words that can reduce and can become n, n. Them can become them or um. At can become it, it. To can become t or d. Can can become can, can. R can become er, er. Was can become was, was. That can become that, that. Your can become your, your. At the can become at the, at the. And so on. So keep an eye out for this as you're studying pronunciation and listening to native speakers. That's it, and thanks so much for using Rachel's English. I'm excited to announce that I'm running another online course, so do check out my website for details. You'll find on there all sorts of information about the course, who should take the course, and requirements. I really hope you'll check it out and consider signing up. I have had a blast with my first online course. I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Don't stop there. Have fun with my real life English videos or get more comfortable with the IPA in this playlist. Learn about the online courses I offer or check out my latest video. A lot All right, of we're figuring out some tech difficulties. And they're new to it. Excuse me.
A lot of people think when they're studying a language and they're new to it that they need to pronounce each word fully and Please let them know. So this is why stress is so important in American English. It's a stress-timed language. When you give us nice shape in your stressed syllables, you're giving us the meaning of the sentence. This In a moment, Jace, just so you know, I'm going to. Rhythm of the English language. This picture here, definitely, it's the way I kind of visualize the rhythm of the language. It's very musical. I don't know if you guys get that when I see it, but it's, it's very. Hold on. So, English is a stress time language. So, again, like the stress sounds, as Rachel said, are the content words. The content words are longer with more emphasis. The unstressed words are the function words. The function words are shorter, flatter, quicker. So the year, the kun, all that stuff, the all the shorting, shortening, the shrinking and linking, that helps explain it. It's not an exact science, but it really, really does a lot to help guide your intuition about the language. So unstressed function words. So Jace, I want to invite you in to just come and break this down, just for like, like two minutes, because I mean you inspired a lot of my thinking, so please just come in and help me break this down. Sure. So let's see. Does he think I'll come today? Does he think I'll come today? And remember, when it's slow, the rhythm is the same. Does he think I'll come today? Does he think that? Does he? So it's not speed, right? Shrinking and linking is rhythm. So what, what are the I think words? We will... What are the stress words? Sorry? In this... In this... Ah, the stress words. Ah, does, does he think I'll come today? Does he think I'll come today? So think, come. Maybe in very slow English, does he think I'll come today? Especially if we want to emphasize not yesterday. So that's sort of the intonation comes in on today, but the basics rhythm is, does he think I'll come today? Okay. The next one, I think we'll have to help them later tonight. Again, we might change this intonation to emphasize things, right? I think we'll have to help them later tonight. That's the basic rhythm, right? Now, I think we'll have to help them later, either later or tonight, Depending. So this is not a science, as Justin's saying. It's more a feel. And I just want to say, Justin, just to make sure, and I'll probably say it again because many times people have been talking about it today. Uh, if you're not a native speaker, what I'm doing right now is not using so much what I know about linguistics and second language acquisition and pronunciation. I'm just listening to it in my head, the way that I would naturally say it, or more importantly, the way that I've heard it so many times in my life in my native language. That ear is not going to be possible for you to have if you're not a native speaker uh, unless you've had enough exposure and experience with it. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how good of a teacher you are. So the good news is some people are saying, I can't teach this. 
uh, I don't think you have to be the model, right? So I've got songs. People have role plays, dialogues where they highlight stress. Uh, I'm going to make much more of this kind of material because this does not have to be something you model, as Sylvia said, something you understand and can help raise their awareness of. But you do not have to be the model for this. And you should not worry about, I don't know where the stress is. It's just getting practice with it and using other people uh, as input is very important for your students. The last one, where do you think the stress is? He can have a cat and dog, but he can't have a horse. Wow. We have 13 syllables, right? He can have a cat and dog, but he can't have a horse. Da 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 this is a great sentence, Justin, because how does can't sound? Does it sound like can't or can? We can Even slowly, to... tell me. He can have a cat and dog, but he can't have a horse. He can't have a horse. Even slowly, he can't, can't sounds like can. I know, I know you teachers out there have heard this a million times. How do I hear the difference between can and can't? Well, he can, right? As Justin put here, he can. He can have, right? Very different for a native speaker. We don't have a problem. Uh, that would be a big problem if we, <laughs> if we couldn't understand the difference easily between can and can't. So right? we ask a question, uh, so it's like, can you? Can you or can't you? But then I say, you can. So can you or can't you? Yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> right, when it's, when, it's, when it's a short, the short form in, a, in an affirmative statement, right? We don't say you can, we say you can, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but think about why, or yes, we don't say, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Uh, because no, I can't has the no in it. So it's really interesting, right, to, to go deep and look under the microscope at how it works. But it doesn't always help learners feel comfortable and fluent. Uh, I'm getting some t-shirt. Yeah, this is Morocco here, by the way, representing. I see some of you uh, noticing that there, yes. Uh, yeah, try shrinking and linking with Arabic, if you'd like to. Um, <laughs> but yeah. This is this is this is a great great example, um, and you know again uh, you don't have to be the one who provides the input. You want uh, input on shrinking and linking? Email me, and there are a lot of other people doing stuff where we're highlighting stress. It's gonna be something more and more. Rachel, as you see, did this video. She's getting very into the rhythm thing, uh, and it's great to be working with her on some of this too. Justin, back to you. All right, thank you so much for the interjection there, helping out. All right, well, there you go. It's coming from from the master himself. So, discourse markers. Um, seems like we're, we're spending a lot of time here. So, was, this is going to be the last part of my presentation here, and then actually, I want to end with just that video again by Idaza, by the way, because I think it's really impressive. But so, discourse markers. It's a dynamic group of words or phrases that serve as linguistic mechanisms to fill pivot to give space and rhythm to your speech and conversation. So it's kind of like, like, kind of like, you know, well, I mean, you see, like, native speakers use these, but I'm always really surprised that people don't learn these in their, in their language learning, and, and it really helps. I can't communicate the same without using these, and neither can Jace, neither can any native, really, because it gives us um, a little bit of space in there. It gives us the dynamic quality of communication. So, using versus not using discourse markers. Let me give you an example. So this is no discourse markers. I'm not totally fluent in Italian, but it's similar to Spanish. They aren't exactly the same, but they have similar grammar. Now I'm going to throw some, some discourse markers in there. So look, you see, I'm not like totally fluent in Italian, you know, but it's kind of like Spanish. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, they aren't exactly the same, but they have kind of like similar grammar, you know? This is very exaggerated, of course. I'm going to state that right now. It's very exaggerated, but it just helps you see that it does have a function in communication. And it seems like a lot of the shrinking and linking that we do comes in discourse markers. So 
it's important to recognize that. Um, so I would like to just show you a quick video. Justin Bieber saying like. Apparently he broke the world record. I know he's not a very famous person right now, but this is a very, <laughs> it's a funny video. So Jace, can you please throw that video up? This is probably, it's about 45 seconds, but just to show you how much he uses this. Please welcome Justin Bieber. New look, new haircut. Not really new haircut, just kind of like like I was like I was like this like 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 and like so like and like like my kind of like my and like I like but like I like it's like I like because like like I like and like 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 it's like like and like just like and like it's like the like like and like 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 I can like like size like 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 she like like for like like. Is like like I'm like she's like Bieber Bieber I'm like Bieber 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 Bieber. <laughs> okay, so that's like it's like painful. I think Ethan said that. <laughs> Anyways, that's just to give you an example and a little bit of humor in this. Justin Bieber uses it way too much. So the application of discourse markers don't abuse them sound like an adolescent when you do it, like Bieber, you don't sound very confident in it, when you're speaking if you use these all the time. Um, experimentation is good. Play around with them. Observe native speech. TV shows might not always give this, but interviews and more authentic speech will. And start integrating them into your English, and you can learn to teach them at that point. I'm sure a lot of you guys can use them naturally from your language learning because you develop them naturally I think as you gain fluency, but it's not, not something that they formally teach generally. So just a review of the knock-knock jokes, survival phrases, we did the greetings and goodbyes, we did the tour of the tenses. Now, the last thing I'm just going to quickly go over the, the imitation of rap music and Igauza, this video that will blow you away. Okay. So, Watch this. This is some language learning heroics. If you watch this in the pre-class, then it will. It's worth watching again. Yo, let me tell you about a situation. We live in a world divided by races and nations, and nobody learns the other person's language. No, so I'm like, yo, somebody needs to change it. So. I started thinking about this thing called flow. Si me permites hablar en español, pues te explico con las lenguas lo que es más importante que es el ritmo. Es como procesamos las palabras conectadas. Y si no aprendes esto, tú no vas a aprender nada. Con sus tablas de conjugaciones, mira, tírense los textos y canten más canciones. La idea es muy sencilla, si puedes pegar, si sí, puedes hablar, si sí, yo puedo hablar el portugués también. Siempre me preguntan, ¿cómo es que se puede hablar sin sotaque? Cara, yo aprendí portugués a través del rap, y ayuda también que yo soy un crack. Da música fonética, lingüística, yo fiz una técnica un poco científica. Pra ensinar como pegar esse flow Seu chifá de anito e bali De ti go Pa ko yu no li Bien de yue la yue Chang ko lai chung wo ren shuo de hua Ni chung kui mo fa In English we call it mimic And no it's not a gimmick I take it target language And teach you to rap in it Oh And you don't even gotta know Jack in it Lay back I'll take the sound, break it down with me, phonetic. You learn the syllables separate and then connect them together. What you get is pénible. Oh my boy, protest sur mon perru. Du coup, je suis l'enquête comme un gros fast ton belly. Mon ton et mon dos, les nice. A vu, t'as eu nos marais, ma chitou, à ce coup, ton marou, bon, bon, réchi. Mon chou, mon chou, ma fille, aussi, hek, what you say, bec, il n'a dit, gâte, salut, au vrai, pour toi, du bouc, t'es hek, bon, hot, ton gros, j'ai un doulis. Funky no a chewe ganga ferki mata pelos ka fili ka fio ka tungi ma fole ka mo wa no kole
I don't claim to be the first person to claim it. But if language is sound, and sound is music, well, that sounds like music is language. What? Listen. I don't want anyone here to confuse it. But if music is sound, and sound is language, that means that language is music. All right, guys. So this actually, just in closing, I don't want to spend a lot of time going into this, but I actually I used his technique a little bit with Portuguese. I, I learned like half of a rap song in the past couple of weeks, and I, it improved a, a little bit. But it was I felt like my my mouth muscles being like working out really, and like like my pronunciation really really improved with the rap song. So um, I recommend just checking it out, and also. He talks about like rap music as the ideal way, ideal type of music to learn a language because it it fits the 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 natural rhythm of the language and it more vigorous vigorously works these muscles. So um, fluency MC he teaches English to rap music. I think that's a really great option. Also, um, I recommend if you don't like uh, normal rap music because of it's it's often inappropriate. I recommend like looking up conscious rap. I'll, I'll type it in here. Like it, it, you find some of the some of the more conscious songs. Um, but anyways, thank you very much. I really enjoy being here. And again, like Jay said, it's not about using all these techniques, but just rec recognizing that they're there and there are people out there with resources that you can use and to really see yourself at, as a coach, as a facilitator, and you can give your students these homework assignments you can you can really um, take a different approach you don't have to know how to teach this stuff like directly but you can give it over to other people who do so thank you very much guys I really appreciate your and you're welcome and just your enthusiasm for everything thanks a lot guys take care. Great, job. great job Justin don't don't yeah. leave yet man uh, Really, really great job. I appreciate you working my stuff in there. Uh, that was great. Uh, Rachel, who we hope to have here in March, she was going to be in this MOOC, uh, Rachel Smith of Rachel's English. Uh, so we hope to have her in March. Someone asked me earlier when the next MOOC is. Uh, it will be in March. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it'd be great to have Rachel here. That was the plan. So uh, because of her schedule, we couldn't. But as you see, we have a lot of other wonderful, wonderful people uh, here, and Justin is certainly one of them, and it's great. He brings the whole real-life uh, English crew through here. Uh, Ethan's here, who's in Barcelona, and uh, how many people are in real life? It's like it's really like the Wu-Tang Clan, where it depends how you count, you know, how many people are in real life. English. Nabila, Laura, is there actual uh, Maria, Maria, Nives. I don't know, Padraji, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry. He's from Indonesia, but... <laughs> how, how many people are in real life English, uh, Justin? Can you our put Facebook a group is in? about almost 20,000, and... Oh, no, no, I didn't get that number. <laughs> I meant the number in, the number of people in your, in your organization. Oh, no, 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 there are actually three. Like, Trevor, there was one guy who left recently, he went to start, like, a meditation revolution. <laughs> But, so try to see the three of us. It's Ethan, who's here, Chad, and I. And but basically, like we have like people who really like core members, really important members who we feel like are part of our family. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely doesn't seem like that. It seems like a, you know this huge posse, which is really cool. Um, and I hope to be involved in a in a party with them soon. So I'll I'll keep you posted on that. Maybe even two two continents. Uh, so we're going to work on that. Uh, anybody have any questions? For We have a couple minutes here. If you want to leave, you can. But this is an opportunity if you have a question you want to ask directly to Justin. <laughs> no need? Okay. You covered everything, Justin. It was so perfect. Thank you, Maria. We'll, we'll, we'll 
take the showers of praise too, right? That's fine. Um, when would the next class be? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, there's only really one class for each of these presenters. I'm so excited when I see, and it's almost every time, people are asking for more uh, from individuals who are here. That's kind of the idea, um, to have further uh, further encounters, classes with these great folks uh, in WizIQ. So we will talk about that. But in the meantime, before that happens, we have more people coming. We have uh, Ajit Ferreira coming, who uh, is also connected in Brazil to the real life. He's coming to our party yeah. on Saturday. Uh, he's up tomorrow. He's coming yeah. to our party on Saturday. Ajit is like, he's a great teacher. He's a, he's, he's a. Look how connected, look how connected we are. This is crazy. It's crazy. Uh, it was meant to be fluency family because you see it was meant to be with RLE and ELTT. It was like you where there's so much we can do. <laughs> Parties all over the map. Let me see those can claps. Uh, just want to tell, please, so yeah, we got Ajit Fajera coming. We've got Carissa Peck who is here today with us. Uh, Carissa, where do you see, where do you see this gal, this woman? She's, she's, uh, wow. I'm so excited to have Carissa Peck coming. We also have Jack, North Kakalaka Jack. Uh, Jack asks you on Thursday, we have Sean Bonville world famous website creator for uh breaking news english and other things so uh people are saying bye bye okay i know we're going too far here we've got 50 seconds left though yeah i'm a little crazy that's okay i hope <laughs> as long as there are enough people that aren't crazy to balance me out look how cool and collected yeah. justin is yeah, I like, great I like to see you like guys that. i'm just like reading the, the feed and like listening to you too but it's just great it's a it's a very it's an emotional experience to see this i feel very connected we're just trying to hook you, man, so you never leave Wiz IQ. That's the idea. Definitely. That's what it's we're doing experience. right now. Uh, but yeah, I, I like I like I like people like I need people like Justin to keep me balanced. Seventeen seconds. See you later. Thank Thanks you guys. For coming. Check out the recording later. We'll have a YouTube recording later. Highlight videos coming soon. Stay with us this week. ELT Thank Tech. You guys. Peace Take care, guys. Back to you, Justin.